This morning, I'd like to talk about the topic, uh, the house of the Lord called heaven. So I'd like to talk about heaven because sometimes we are so earthly bound and so into the things of this earth that sometimes heaven doesn't get much press. Have you noticed that? Yeah. We're so earthly bound and tied to our things here that a place called heaven doesn't get much thought. So I was thinking about the fact that as we're living our lives, are we living our lives in the hope of eternity? So let's bow together and pray. Lord, we know that every believer, you are preparing a place for us in heaven. And Lord, it's by your grace, not because we deserve it, not because anyone's worthy, because of the worthiness of Christ and what he's done for us. I pray that we'll understand it anew and afresh I pray this next few weeks will be a blessed time for us to reflect on our eternal destiny, which God plans for everyone, everyone who will receive this gift. And why, I do not understand why, some do not. But Lord, those that have received it, thank you for the blessedness called heaven. And that's where our citizenship is. And I thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Did you know Jesus' first sermon in Matthew chapter five? called the Beatitudes, was about heaven. He started the line, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the persecuted, for they'll rejoice about their reward in heaven. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Amazing text, amazing, wonderful verses. You know, a lot of people though like heaven for the same reason a lot of people like Florida. A lot of people like Florida because they know the weather's always nice and they have all their relatives there, so that's why. But, but that's not why we like heaven. Revelation tells us, Revelation 21, one through five. After Jesus comes again, then this will happen. Then I saw a new heaven and new earth. For the first heaven and first earth passed away and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among the people, and God will dwell among them, and God will be among and with his people. God himself will be among them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for this old order of things will pass away. And he who sits on the throne says, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, write these words down because they're trustworthy and true. They, they truly are. God's plan for us was to be with him forever and never be separated. Jesus said, if you trust in the Father and trust in me, then he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you and you could go to heaven. You know, heaven is a place of surprises. It's truly a place of wonderful and powerful surprises. It says that powerfully in the scripture, eye has not seen nor ear heard. It hasn't even entered the heart of any person what God is preparing for those to love him. Wonderful, beautiful surprises in heaven. You know, reminds me of the story. There was a well-off son because his father was well-off. And the son, all he wanted for, for high school graduation was a new car. And so the high school graduation came. And after the high school graduation, his father brought in a box. The son opened the box and he found a Bible in it with a note on the uh, top of the Bible saying, in this is everything you need. The son was irate. He was angry. He put down his, the Bible right there in the living room, walked out, went to college, then after college he got a job, never spoke to his father again because he didn't get his car. Well, time went on. He was so bitter and hateful that he never spoke to his father again. And that's that. His father died at 65, kind of early. They came back to the house, first time he'd been in the house since that high school graduation, really. And he came in and looked at that Bible still sitting there. 
on the desk in the living room. He went up to it in anger after the funeral. He picked up that Bible and started to throw it away. And something fell out of that Bible. It was a check for the price of a brand new car sitting in that Bible. It's unbelievable how the surprises of God will be there. But we must, like Jesus said, we must believe that he's the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, Jesus said, will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. But Jesus didn't end there. Jesus asked Martha, do you believe this? Jesus asks each one of us, do you believe he's the resurrection and the life? And I like what Martha said, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Have you said yes to the Lord in your life? She said, I have come to believe that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God, he who comes in to the world. You know, not everyone will seek God. Not everyone will experience that gift that God wants us all to have, like that father put the, the check for the brand new car inside that Bible. But what a beautiful father to say, everything you need is within this book. That's powerful. That's a good person. You know, God's people's purpose is to lead men and women to heaven and then to prepare men and women to serve God in the kingdom of heaven, that is on earth. Now, it's amazing and powerful to believe that Jesus is the key in the door to heaven. We don't hear that very often today. It says it's appointed unto man once to die and then comes the judgment. It's appointed to die once, then comes the judgment. So how do we escape judgment? Through Christ, through the forgiveness of Christ. It says clearly, Acts chapter four, verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else, Peter said. There is no other name than Jesus Christ under heaven that we've been given by which we must be saved. There's no other name, no other path. Jesus himself said it beautifully in John chapter 10, verse 9. And I'd like to read it to you. John 10, verse 9. I am the door, Jesus said. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. So Christ is that door to heaven. There's no other way. Remember Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, I'm that gate and that door. Now I know there's a lot of people that don't believe in judgment. I realize that lawbreakers don't believe in laws either. But there's a lot of people that believe they don't believe their creator. See, they think they're in charge. No, you're not in charge, your creator's in charge. He tells us reality. C.S. Lewis says, don't make God in your image. Don't reject or accept judgment just because you think it's wrong or right. God said it, C.S. Lewis said, and do not make God in your own image like Adam and Eve did, a quote from C.S. Lewis. That's what Adam and Eve did. Do you realize the Old Testament is beautiful? In Hebrews chapter 11, it says all the Old Testament saints were motivated by the fact that they were heading toward a city that God built, a heavenly kingdom, a heavenly city whose builder and architect was God. So all the Old Testament saints were motivated in this life by their destiny, heaven. They knew about heaven. So what road are we on? You know, it's interesting when we take a trip. I don't know about you, but taking a trip, a two-week vacation or a trip, takes a lot of preparation, doesn't it? You just, you just walk out the door and go on a trip and come back? No, take some preparation. The mail, the dogs, kennel, you know, the, the, you know, you gotta make sure all the things are covered while you're gone. But there's one thing that I like, and maybe you'd like, I don't know, but there's one thing that once you've had a good vacation and you head home, how many here are glad when they're heading home though? They look forward to heading home. Okay, not many at all, okay. Well, I look forward to it. When you have a good vacation and you're heading home, I say, yay, we're on our way home. That's our goal. I love our house. You know, well, many are on the road of the broad road and many are on the narrow road. What does that mean? I, I, I think about it a lot. Is, are you taking the easy broad road or the narrow uh, hard road? 
Who said that? See, everything Jesus said. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13 through 14, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell or destruction is broad, Jesus said, and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. There are many that choose that way. But the gate to life, the gateway to life is very narrow. And the road is difficult and only a few find it. And it seems like that's really experience tells us that same thing. Many people love God on their own terms, not the God of the Bible, not God in his terms. I don't wanna love God on my terms. I wanna love God on his terms. So, so many are heading down a road to disaster and separation from God and judgment. Some are heading down, heading down the road to God's eternal home, God's eternal place. You know, I, I want from the Bible and I want from God and I want from churches. I hope we give you the truth, all the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, right? Amen. Not our version of truth, not what we want to be true. I think that's the most ultimate form of idolatry to come up with your own set of beliefs and stand in the face of God and you tell God what you believe rather than submitting to what God believes. Ultimate form of idolatry. But I also think we're dominated by so many things in life. We're so dominated by things that don't matter. We're dominated by this life only. And I realized someone's, I had a person actually in church many years ago say, heaven is remote. Heaven kind of is irrelevant. So I talked to this woman, I said, heaven is remote? Heaven is really irrelevant? Well, she said, well, really, it's irrelevant until I get about 90, you know? She was about 65 at the time. I said, oh, really? So at 90, you're going to think about heaven? Oh, yeah, when I get 90, I'll think about heaven. Literally, I was told that. Amazing. Sad. You know, we don't know our life. I found out later, you know, she was 65 when she told me that. And she said, at 90, I'm going to think about heaven. I found out later, <laughs> she died at 74. You know, James says it very clearly. Come on now, you say, today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business, make a profit. And it didn't say there in James, go to the mall, but probably that's in there, to go to the mall. <laughs> Yet you do not know what your life will be tomorrow. Boy, that's true. I'll read it again. You don't know what your life's gonna be tomorrow for you are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. You know that fog in the morning? Sun comes out, dissipates it. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will do this or we will do that. You know, I found one thing in life that the Bible's always true and humans are always wrong if it's conflicting with God, okay? Ecclesiastes, I, I really thought about early as a believer in Christ. Ecclesiastes 9.12. For indeed, a person does not know his time, like a fish that is caught in treacherous net and birds caught in a snare. So the sons of mankind are ensnared at, at, at evil times, and suddenly death comes upon them unknowingly. I, I said, that, that sounds negative, but it's not. It's saying, we don't know. Nobody knows the time of their death. Nobody knows when that snare comes. I'm so thankful that when we know Christ, we don't have to worry. We don't have to fret. You know, a lot of world religions say live in the moment. Jesus says, live for eternity, live for eternal life. And Jesus said eternal life begins the moment you believe. Now, Jesus did say live to, in the moment in a sense, don't worry. Remember, Jesus said, don't worry about today's problems, okay? I mean, don't worry about tomorrow's problems. Just worry about today's problems. But he, didn't, he didn't mean just live in the moment. Because Jesus said, what does it profit a person? What gain to a person? to get the whole world, everything the world has to offer and yet lose his soul, his eternal soul. You know, the world and the church don't think about heaven much, but I tell you the world and the church, everybody thinks about this. They long for a better place. Everybody does. Heaven is not just wishful thinking or a hope. It's God's purposes, purpose for everybody. God's wonderful purpose. Now. I love when you study the Bible, you discover new things. You ever discovered new things when you study the Bible, anybody? Anybody discover new things God tells you? This one, it was amazing, never thought about it. Heaven is called the Father's house, home. Heaven, the Father's house. Jesus in the temple, the worship place, Jesus said this, 
How dare you do this in my father's house? Anybody say amen to that? No one? <laughs> Lord, when we worship you, we're in your house. Well, his house is anywhere his presence is. That just blew me away. Just absolutely said, wow, Lord. Worship is so special when your people gather. It's so wonderful. I, you know, think about the millions of galaxies and the plans God had for creation. God has a plan for every life. Why do we talk about heaven? Because our life is but a vapor. We have a body, but we're, are we a soul wrapped up in a body or just a body? Which are we? The world would have you believe you're just a body. That's it. You kind of have something inside, but who cares? You're just a body. You're just physical. According to the Bible, we're a soul wrapped up in a body. That's so much different. And God desires everyone to be saved. And that's what's important. And our departure, you know, have you ever thought about the statistics on death? It's very impressive, the statistics on death. One in one person dies, that's 100%, okay? So the statistics are 100%. We die because of God's judgment. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we need to realize what a deep impact our lives mean because we have an eternal soul. That's what makes us, and the body is just a wrapping, a tent, a cover. It's important, the body, but it's just a tent that we live in. C.S. Lewis said in History of the World, what a great quote, he said, those that thought much of the next world did the most for this world. And C.S. Lewis said, the more the church gets bogged down in this world, the little effect they will have on this world and the next world. C.S. Lewis goes on to say, aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. You know, Paul was the most motivated man I've ever seen to serve God I've ever seen. He got a glimpse of heaven through his ministry when he was stoned for preaching the gospel in Lystra. And I love the text. Luke writes it very beautifully. He says he got stoned for preaching the gospel. They drug his body out, started to dig the grave for Paul, and Paul stood up, you know, and walked on. And I look at that miracle and go, boy, talk about you're invincible until God's purpose is done for your life. You know, that's Paul. I believe Paul said this. He never said it was him. We know it was him, but he just tried to be humble. 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I don't know or out of the body I don't know, God knows, such a man was caught up into the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I don't know. God knows. He was caught up in a paradise and heard inexpressible words, which a man is not permitted to speak nor could he ever speak them. Wow. I knew a man, Paul said, who 14 years ago, this had this experience and it certainly motivated him. You know, the greatest of saints think often of heaven. The most godly you are, the more you think of heaven. You know, and you really think less of earth. You know, this scripture really spoke to me. Acts chapter 2, verse 40 through 42. Peter on Pentecost, with many other words, he warned them and pleaded them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Now those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 3, souls were added that day. And after they were added to the Lord, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Well, those couple verses say so much about who we are, what we're to do, and what we're to believe. But I just couldn't believe. Save yourself from this corrupt generation. We're definitely in a corrupt generation. Paul said in Galatians 1.5, Christ has given himself for our sins to deliver us out of this present evil age. Peter tells us so often this fact in 2 Peter. In 2 Peter, he tells us what, what motivates us. 
you know, if, if you believe in heaven, does that demotivate you or make you better down on earth? Well, according to Peter, it makes you better down on earth. But the, the day of the Lord will come like a thief, Peter said. This is 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13, or 10 through 11. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be dis uh, destroyed. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be? You should be holy in conduct and you should be godly. Boy, he's saying because of this coming, you should be different here now on earth. Paul says so clearly, in the last days destructive times will come. Look at what 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 4 says. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 4. In the last days, the church will fall away. Many will believe the teachings of demons. There'll be a total moral collapse of conscience. In 2 Timothy now, Paul says in the last days also, perilous, dangerous times will come. People will be lovers of self, money, arrogant, proud, ruthless, rioters, revelers, hostile, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, malicious, without self-control, brutal, murderers. People will hate what is good and godly. They'll be treacherous, mass corruption, breakdown of the law. The religion won't have any form that God made it to have and they'll be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So sometimes before that you talk about the good news of heaven, you gotta talk about the bad news of what? The bad news of where this earth is at. And we can be delivered. I'm so thankful we can be delivered. I'm so thankful that we can defeat hate with the love of God. I'm sad that hate comes in all forms. And we need to stand believing that our impact can make a difference. Like MLK. It's amazing how hate is so strong today. And we need to make love so strong today. People hate the truth. People hate differences. People hate races. People, they're interracial hate. They're, people hate the rich, hate the poor. There's political hate. But most of all, there's hate of Christians. And Jesus said, don't be angry or hateful. This is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. Don't be angry or hateful with someone. You'll be guilty before God, guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. I cannot believe that the power of hate leads us to nothing but destruction. And we need to stand against it in loving and firm conviction that God's way is the only way. You know, it's amazing. There was a couple things that were beautiful and some of the basic questions about heaven aren't even seen. I'm so thankful that, aren't you glad that hate will not be in heaven, anybody? Amen. Evil will not be in heaven? Amen. It's interesting, God said in the last two chapters of Revelation, that God has a special despising for hate, for lying, for idolatry, for murder, for sexual immorality. God names these things and said they're not going to be here. Isn't that great news? Isn't that great news? Thank you. Those things will not be in heaven. But the basic question of heaven we have to ask before we go today. First question is I love what D. James Kennedy of Coral Ridge uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. His church gave the evangelism explosion. It trained everybody in his church to do it. And one of the key questions was this. If you died tonight and God asked you, why should you be led into heaven? If Jesus Christ, now remember Jesus Christ is going to stand at the door, not Peter, okay? So I know some of you are trained that Peter's going to stand at the door. No, it's Jesus at the door. He's the door to heaven. Jesus, if Jesus asked the question, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? What would you say? I know the answer is this. Because I've repented and I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I have put my sins on him. And I've received him as my Lord and personal Savior. 
Heaven is a real place, a powerful place, and we need to be thankful. So what is the password to heaven? Think about it for just a minute. What is the password to heaven? What would you say? Is the password, I'm a good person, let me in? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, no. Is the password, I've been religious? No, it's not religion. In fact, many times religion leads you away from God. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what saves you. Is it being an honest, I've heard this, I'm an honest person. You're gonna tell me you've never lied, cheated, taken anything, never had a lustful thought. You know, I've never looked at someone lustful. I mean, come on. You're gonna tell me you're a real honest, good person, really? God knows your every thought and your every deed and your every word. And a lot of people say, well, I go to church. Well, that doesn't even work anymore because a lot of good Christians don't even go to church anymore, <laughs> you know? So if you say, I go to church, I would, God would say, well, yeah, that's what I plan for all my people to go to church. So no, that's not the password. I just can't believe everything we have now has a password on it, right? You have to have a notebook with all your passwords written down. It's just incredible. Anyway. Is a password I give to charity. That's it, right? I've given to charity. God would say, well, I've given you life and breath and all things. The answer is this. What opens the heavens is you've received Jesus Christ. I am a sinner, Lord. I've repented. I've received Christ as my Savior. I put my sins on the cross. He's forgiven me. I've come to Jesus Christ and him and him alone. The password that opens heaven, heaven's gates. A lot of people say, well, does everybody need it? Well, do you think Jesus died for just a limited few? He went to the cross for a limited few. No, for everyone. How does God find everyone? I don't know. But any soul that seeks God, God will find them. Don't worry about it. He will find them. I've seen even the Middle East, people seeking God, and there's been visions of Christ given to people. We've had testimonies of missionaries but you know the bottom line is and this is my closing story but I I, I, I got this two weeks ago and this kind of led me to reflect on heaven and it really just amazed me anyway I saw a story on the news two weeks ago and it was a little girl a little five-year girl in Texas who couldn't see from birth and they did an experimental surgery on her eyes, but they said in doing this experimental surgery, only 10% chance it'll work. And in doing this surgery could make her eyes even worse, so there's no hope the rest of her life. So the parents prayed about it. I couldn't believe it, right there on TV. We prayed about it, yay. And that they chose the doctor to do the surgery. Well, he did the surgery, five days, the gauze and the little, little things were on her eyes. So they took, the doctor had mentioned, they, he took the bandages off and took the little patches on her eyes off. This little five-year-old girl all of a sudden said, I can see you, doctor, I can see you, the nurse. Mommy, daddy, I can see you. And then it, it, the story was the mother said, she ran to the window and said, look at the beautiful grass. Look at the beautiful blue sky. Look, mom, mommy, mommy, daddy. Look at the flower. I mean, she went on and on and on. And this is the touching part. She said, mommy, it's beautiful. Why didn't you tell me how beautiful it was, mommy? The mother said, I tried to tell you, sweetie. But you had to see it for yourself. You know, when we get to heaven... We're going to tell the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to tell the God our Father. Why didn't you tell us how beautiful heaven was? You didn't tell us much, but why didn't you tell us how beautiful it is? And God will say, I did a little bit, but you just had to see it for yourself. Amen. You had to see it for yourself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your place is far, far better. All your creative power is unleashed in heaven. We live on the fallen earth. 
but Lord in heaven is that unleash your power and love and imagination and everything you are, God, will be seen there. Paul said, it's far, far better. For me to live as Christ, Paul said, to die as gain, it's far better. Our minds can't conceive it. The best is yet to come is it just a cliche because it's so much better. All of heaven is beautiful because all of God is in display there. Because God cared for more for us than he did himself in sending his son. So we ask the question, have we received Christ, the door to heaven? Have we said, Lord, I, my life is away from you. I have sinned. I receive what you did for me on the cross, took care of every sin I have ever committed, put it on yourself, and I put my sins on you, Lord Jesus. I believe in you, and, and Lord Jesus is not a one-night stand. I don't just come to you and then live my life the way I want. I come in, and then I go out. No, I become a disciple. I'm yours forever. I follow you after I receive you. I believe your word, and I feed, and I grow in you, Lord, and I look forward to that place you prepared for me. You've prepared a special design place for everybody. And God says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, God desires all to be saved, to come to the knowledge of the truth. I pray, Father. I pray all receive you now as Lord and Savior. And what a reception one day we'll have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.